Welcome to the Idea Pod, a podcast dedicated to exploring and interrogating professional biomedical and applied ethics here at the University of Leeds. In part two of challenges and pitfalls of data privacy during the pandemic, we continue our conversation with Andrew Dyson, managing partner for DLA Piper's Leeds office. He is also global co-chair of DLA Piper's Data Protection, Privacy and Security Group, editorial board member for the Journal of Data Protection and Privacy, and visiting research fellow in applied ethics at the Idea Center. That takes us to our second issue, which is the mobile apps developed for this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. I'm talking about symptom trackers and other type of apps. There are a bunch of them that have been developed uh, all over the world. We have some in Singapore, like the Trace Together. We have some in the US called K-Health. We have our own here in the UK with COVID symptom tracker. And generally, the, the, the public is concerned about surveillance issues. So, uh, you know, how these apps are taking data location, including aggregated data retention, repurposing the data and the metadata that the, these apps can get from you. And so an ethical concern has to do with, uh, you know, we can be in this particular context, be pushed towards collaborating for the public good well, risking our privacy, because there is some sort of feeling that, well, I can do my part, I can collaborate with this, I can help solve a problem that we're all facing. And so we might be tempted to contribute, whereas in a normal situation, we might have uh, our doubts in uh, joining this type of apps. So uh, the aim, I think, is to have an ethical balance between public health and you know privacy and security issues. So in the case of these mobile apps, um, I, I would be interested in you uh, talking a little bit about you know, the personal data that people are so afraid of because uh, personal data could be exposed and repurposed. And a lot of people don't really know what personal data is. It, it is normally associated with you know, your address, your phone number, your age, but what is exactly uh, personal data from a legal perspective? Yes, there's so many things in there, aren't there? I mean, I think, um, yeah, let's start with the question of personal data. So, so personal mm-hmm. data from a, a legal point of view, and this is the, and this is the, the reason this is important, is because things like the GDPR all apply only when you're dealing with personal data. They don't mm-hmm. deal with anonymized data, which is very important to separate the two. But personal data is, is certainly defined in a European context as being any information which relates to an individual um, which from which they can be identified either directly or indirectly now that's kind of legalese but it's it's basically saying at one extreme it's it's you know kind of contact list with your name and address and phone number and national insurance number i mean that's clearly identifiable data that relates to an individual so that's very obvious i don't think anyone's got a problem with that Mm -hmm. understanding that that's personal data but it also has this kind of concept of um, information which relates to you or from which you might be identified either directly or indirectly. So that would also include things which are like codes or reference numbers, which, you know, you pick up a national insurance number, but it doesn't mean anything in and of itself. But if it's linked to my tax credits or yeah. my behavior um, somewhere, then, then of course, uh, then of course it does have that relationship back to me and I'm identifiable from it. And the same is true of things like, email addresses even if i'm using an alias ultimately it's still me behind the email address and i'm still communicating or uh, take it another step beyond that things like ip addresses or you know device identification identifiers on on mobile phones these are all identifiers which um you know an ip address is just a string of numbers when you look at it uh, and you say well is that personal identity is that personal data we we would say it it almost certainly is because it's it's information that links an activity to a device and that device is linked almost certainly to one or maybe a couple of people at most. So, um, you know, so they have this very broad concept of personal data and everything um, that sits within that remit is then regulated. Important, anything which is anonymous data is not regulated. So you're kind of free to do what you like with anonymous data. It's not regulated. And anonymous data is really information which is stripped of 
of all identifiable features but more than that it cannot in any way if it's been derived in some way from from one of those other uh, uh, personal data sets you 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 know it's it's technically impossible effectively to kind of find out which data set you're talking about and take it back to uh, the personal data so it's a very high threshold but if you get there the reward is great because you can effectively do what you like without worrying about privacy laws um but everything to the right of that, if you like, is is going to be personal data, and that then brings in frame all kinds of responsibilities um, under things like the GDPR. And, and I guess if you take that to kind of your question was about surveillance, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, concerns with things like these contact tracing apps, uh, it's very interesting because um, all of them, to some extent, are going to rely on some degree of personal data. Now, you know, the question, the sort of the key principles that you know all the regulators key regulators are coming out with it says we you know we for this to for these things to operate they need to be able to identify ultimately an individual because if i'm reporting right. proximity encounters with my neighbors or my friends it has to relate ultimately back to me otherwise it's of no use to the contact tracer when there's a problem downstream so it ultimately relates to me but what you absolutely should be doing is baking in and we have this concept of privacy by design baking into the design of the solution privacy principles, which are things like, well, so far as possible, minimize the amount of personal data that you collect. So we recognize it has to have a degree of personal data field to it, otherwise it won't work, but minimize the amount. So in all the apps that you've been mentioning, the, the levels of personal data collected are, are, are really are minimal. I mean, uh, in, in almost all of them, they are encrypting uh, data encounters. They are um, using codes uh, which have no direct relationship back to an, an individual so you couldn't look at the code and in any way to sort of tie it back to a particular individual it would link to a particular device and a phone but you wouldn't know exactly which phone it was unless that individual decided to to share that data with you so you know the the the, the, the expectation is that you minimize the amounts of personal data you don't collect any name address details you literally have a, a registration code and then the contact information itself is shared in a way which again doesn't allow for one phone to really know which the other phone is they know that the two are talking to each other has been an encounter uh, but unless effectively the key is planted into and lock it and send an alert to say there's a problem um, you know neither user would ever know which other users it's been in contact with so uh, i'm kind of summarizing what is quite a complex uh, mm -hmm. set of uh, technologies but ultimately the designs are made and you can minimize the, the the levels of data and the nature of data collected for the thing to operate and that's kind of a fundamental piece um there are other kind of really important pieces too so uh so trying to uh you know limit how much data is collected so you only collect as much data as you need to do the contact tracing so it might be tempting to collect a whole range of other information about diagnostic things or performance data really not you know the, the, the expectation is that's minimized as far as possible uh, retaining data for only long as needed so only keeping this data for as long as is necessary there's a big debate about how long you keep it for but in the uk at least they've been talking about you know only keeping data for i think 28 days, 28 days. that's the period of time within which you know from being asymptomatic right through to someone logically being ill and reporting it is this sort of typical period of time so you really shouldn't be needing to keep contact data for more than 28 days is is the view here um and and you know only sharing data when you absolutely necessary is needs needs to happen so lots of controls like that and another really important one uh, that we see with these uh, apps and it, there is a distinction here between different countries is to what extent are they kind of mandatory or or voluntary by which i mean are you required to download and use this app or is it a voluntary thing and it's back to your you sort of said this at the beginning you know as an individual many people i think want to support the wider public health mm -hmm. benefits of contact tracing and supporting public health and allowing the economy to get, to get back to to work if you like by having a solution like this deployed others may be more skeptical and and so uh you know allowing people to make an informed decision about this and informed comes back to the transparency piece of knowing what I'm signing up to um, is really important. So, you know, another key feature of a lot of these solutions is making them just voluntary, allowing people to kind of opt out or delete them when they don't want to use them anymore or if they feel uncomfortable. So there's a lot of kind of those sort of solutions baked in. But in other jurisdictions, um, 
you know, there has been talk of some of them being made mandatory. So yeah. uh, that, that clearly doesn't apply in some of the Western democracies that we're, we're talking about. But, but there is a debate ethically there about is this so important you have to make it mandatory and everyone has to use it. And if you don't sort of pain of sufferance, um, uh, the, the sort of impact, we're, we're operating in a, in a legal and regulatory environment, which is not like that. It's certainly more on the voluntary side, but tied into that, all those protections about minimisation, retention, security, uh, transparency about what's happening, giving people the opportunity to change their 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 their, 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 their options downstream. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, a part of the debate about this uh, surveillance state and the possibility of using these apps to control the population also relates to a potential trade-off consider between privacy and effectiveness. So um, some people, some researchers sort of think that uh, the effectiveness of these apps is only going to uh, be proven if we make the whole population participate, if we make it mandatory. And like you were saying, uh, that seems to trump uh, privacy, privacy concerns as well. So uh, in this sense, uh, do, you, do you think that extreme circumstances call for what in normal times we would consider as legally or ethically dubious? Or is the existence of an emergency state not enough justification by itself to make any type of privacy violation or intrusion legitimate? Yeah, I, I think it's a really, well, it's not a legal question, it's an ethical question, it's a philosophical one. But yes. I think, <laughs> I, I'm very clear in my thinking. First of all, mm -hmm. I'd say I think all of these solutions, if you follow the principles I've just said about yeah. making, being transparent to people, bringing them on this journey with you, explaining why it's important, explaining how you've built in trusted technologies into the solution to protect their rights and interests and make them feel comfortable about it, you will achieve all those goals. So you will build trust, you'll get engagement, you'll get the outcomes, uh, and you'll have a successful, strong society in response to this. I think if you if you say, if you assume that the user is stupid and uninformed and doesn't need to have that level of engagement, and the only real answer to this is, is, is making it mandatory, um, and, and then you go down the road of not explaining things to people, you know, you, you fundamentally are not trusting you know, your population in that environment. You, you know, I think you are dealing with a very different type of governmental structure then, aren't you? Because you're sort of saying yeah. the relationship between society, well, the individual and the state is completely different. It's not one of trust. It's one of you're subservient to us. You shall do what we tell mm -hmm. you. And, and if you don't, you might find yourself locked in prison. But I, I guess... Um, you know, are, how do people respond to that? I mean, in some environments, I mean, look, I'm not going to prejudge North Korea, but some like <laughs> environments like that, people probably yeah. would just do that because that's the way that you've been brought up since birth. But if you tried to impose that in, you know, Western democracy like the UK, you will get a significant number of people who, uh, who are clearly going to object to that, who may kind of take up arms they may and we've seen some of this in the US with the sort of response to far lesser issues around uh, the, the pandemic response so you know you've you, the society we live in will not beyond a certain point tolerate some of this and mm -hmm. that will lead to a breakdown of trust in much more fundamental things than just an app or this technology it will be about the relationship between government and society which you know is a much more fundamental thing so of course you could look to mandate it, but I think you have to understand who you're dealing with. Uh, and if you don't bring people on your journey, if what that's what the consequences of that are going to be. Uh, and, and in some environments, it's clearly going to be one where people are going to object and refuse or misuse it or not report. And, you know, so you, it, it will have consequences. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I, I would like to ask you sort of more of a personal question in some sort of sense. Uh, these uh, general issues that we have, this false sense of security, um, our reliance on technology has been questioned by a lot of people. So um, I always wonder, is technology always the answer? I mean, there, there could be other ways of approaching these type of issues. Uh, there could be another way of um, dealing with certain problems in society and you being um, very close to these uh, technological challenges. What do you think? Is technology always the answer? So, so uh, I, I don't think it's always the answer, no. I think it is part of the answer, mm -hmm. um, but only if it's used and adopted sensibly. Um, uh, and, you know, we're part of the 
data ethics forum which we work together with the university on and have lots of debates with some of the professors in the ai department and, and your department about kind of these issues and it, you know to me you know if you're designing a system and it's got algorithms and things like that built into it to support the solution which looks on the face of it like it's going to solve some great conundrum um I, i'm always delighted that the technology is out there to make the world a better place or to innovate and to you know, make improvements to our ways of working in society, whatever it might be. But I think a healthy dose of scepticism is also really important because we need to make sure we haven't lost the human connection. We need to understand fundamentally how these things operate and what's understand what there are always going to be downsides. There's always going to be risks. Um, where I struggle with some of these technology solutions is where people implement them blindly because they have such great faith in the technology. Um, they don't and are not willing to kind of consider the potential risks and address them. So I think if you follow the technology blindly, you end up ultimately, yeah, in some cases, of course, you get some great outcomes. Um, but often you hit a brick wall at some point and you go backwards. I think if you can engage sensibly with people who, particularly in the privacy world, you know, uh, have understand and can challenge you on some sensible issues about well do we know how this operates do we understand what people's concerns might be about this do we understand the potential risks of bias or discrimination or whatever else it might be um and let's bake an effective response of that into the solution itself and then let's make sure when we roll this thing out we're getting proper engagement with people explaining what's going on and then let's make sure that once it's being implemented we've got effective governance to make sure that inevitably there will be you know, glitches or things that go wrong, that we're picking those up, we're open about them, we're going to respond to them, we're going to refine this, we're going to make it better, we're going to explain it to people. You know, all of these things build trust. Um, and so, you know, any technology is only as good as it's the trusted environment in which it's being operated, back to that kind of example of the train. And so people need to have confidence that this works and understands inevitably there's some risks, but let's not hide them away. Let's explain how we're dealing with them and let's let's move forward with that rather than uh, think technology in and of itself is a panacea without being honest about uh, or taking the time to explore and look at these other issues. Well, I think that's a great way to end this uh, tiny discussion. I think it's been great. We have highlighted um, the value of trust, how it relates to transparency, and that ultimately the responsibility of how we deal with these technologies, the cybersecurity issues, or any other related ethical dilemmas we might face have to do with accessibility, have to do with that transparency and how important it is to maintain trust and to build it from design. So thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. It's a pleasure. No, thank you so much. This is all for this episode. Thank you for listening and until next time. The Idea Pod is produced by the Interdisciplinary Ethics Supply Center at the University of Leeds. Find out more at www.leeds.ac.uk/ethics. Music composed and conducted by Josh Armitage.